It's what we call their art, where they chiseled at stone, painted on rocks, and scraped the earth. Many of the Indians were accomplished artists, as evidenced by these accurate representations of wildlife. Which makes it difficult to explain these pictures. Of all the Indian petroglyphs, none perhaps is quite so unexplainable as these. No one has been able to decipher them. Los Angeles engineer Charles Ruggles thinks he has discovered the key to the mysterious petroglyphs. These are scientific drawings. They could be taken right out of a physics textbook. They show sine waves, they show triangle waves, they show square waves, uh, they show electromagnetic circuitry, they show switching, they show almost everything that we could think of in a modern electronics and electromagnetic laboratory. These petroglyphs tell a very intriguing story and it's very much worth investigating. The Indian folklore tells about two flying objects that collided in space over Death Valley and one of them fell in Mustard Canyon. The folklore doesn't tell where the other one fell. Now, with these two objects which made forced landings or actually fell, there was damage. And someone came to repair them. They did it in such a way that they could hopefully reassemble them. And as they disassembled it, it was recorded on apparatus such as this or other forms of uh, communication. To the Indians, these symbols were the symbols of the gods and magic to them. And that's why they reproduced them in the area. One of the most unusual reports in recent years tells of a discovery made near the Coso mountain range in Southern California. As represented here for In Search Of, three rock hounds were out looking for interesting samples to add to their collections. been looking for hours that hot day in July. What they found looked innocent enough, a geode common to that area. Yet, it somehow seemed different. Later, after they saw the rock in half, they felt they had made a unique discovery. That inside, was a strange ceramic-like material resembling some electrical device, like a spark plug. X-ray results were published, and they were astonishing. The object did not appear to be naturally formed.
space. An endless tapestry of stars reaching toward infinity. Scattered through its vastness are 100 billion planets on which life theoretically could exist. If only 1% of that life is intelligent, there could be 1 million civilizations out there. And of that million, it is conceivable that one discover the secrets of space travel. It is possible that ancient astronauts went in search of life beyond their own world and found it on the planet Earth. The existence of other intelligent beings in the universe intrigues the men of tomorrow's science. The exobiologists, students of life in outer space. Dr. Harold P. Klein of NASA's Ames Research Center. The knowledge that this kind of life that we know of in this planet is not the only one, will have very profound influence, whether that other life is more advanced or less advanced than we are. The very knowledge that uh, life can originate uh, spontaneously will have, I believe, very profound effects on the thinking of man in terms of what he is and what his role is in the universe. Now, it has been suggested by other people that maybe life on Earth was brought here by a visitor from another planet. Dr. James Lawless. Uh, while this possibility is remote, it certainly can't be excluded on the basis of the results which we have found. If ancient astronauts did land here, what effect would they have had upon early Earthmen? Perhaps they were worshipped, feared, loved. Perhaps they brought gifts, a new world of knowledge, or simply the principle of the lever. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. The Baghdad Museum in Iraq has on display a clay vase dating back before the birth of Christ. The vase is also a 2,000-year-old battery. A small copper tube is placed in the narrow neck and a rod made of a metal alloy is inserted in the copper tube. When filled with hydrochloric acid, it produces an electric current. The vase was, it seems, a primitive galvanic cell battery. Count Volta is credited with having invented the electric cell 2,500 years later. Was the secret of electricity revealed to man thousands of years ago? Is it possible that this planet Earth has been visited by travelers from outer space? Did they wander through the throbbing light years of the universe in search of other life and find it here? archive of unexplained phenomena. Gigantic creations, in effigy of what? To appease or acclaim whom? Early stone carvers left silent records for their descendants, to tell us something but not quite enough. Statues modeled after strange beings, statements to the scope of their awesome powers. legend surrounds their origin. Strange stories of gods who appeared riding across the skies in flaming chariots of light. Whole civilizations were structured around these gods. Civilizations which at one time flourished and then mysteriously disappeared. Only stone relics survived to give mute testimony to their time. Their true history has been the cause of much scientific inquiry and romantic speculation. Eric von Däniken, a German professor possessed of the mind of a scientist and the imagination of a romantic, wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods. 
He stated that sometime in the distant past, man was visited by intelligent beings from outer space. What in olden times might have been heresy is today intriguing speculation. Von Daniken traveled to all corners of the world, gathering evidence in support of his theory. Or is it a theory? Judge for yourself. Istanbul, the city on the Golden Horn. Here stands the palace of Topkapi. A curious set of maps are kept here, which were found in the Orient by the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis. The oldest of these maps dates back to approximately the first century AD. They are most likely copies of still earlier maps. As astronauts high above Cairo, we would view the Earth in the configuration seen on the old maps. The outlines of the modern maps are the same as the pattern visible on the Piri Reis charts. Another map in the collection shows a region which is still largely unexplored, the Antarctic. The existence of Antarctica as a continent was only established in the 19th century. And it wasn't even explored until 1911 by a Norwegian, Roald Amundsen. The map dates from 1532, a time when the techniques and basic equipment were unavailable to determine longitude. The question lingers. What was the source of information? The world's first great cities might have been constructed, according to von Donegan, under the supervision of the same being who offered instruction for making the maps of Piri Reis. Teotihuacan lies on a broad, flat plain curtained by mountains in central Mexico. It was once the center of the highly advanced Aztec Empire. When the Spaniards arrived in the early 16th century, they found an established society of artisans and intellectuals. The name Teotihuacan means where the gods reside. And the city of the gods is dominated by the Pyramid of the Sun. It is 216 feet high and forms a small mountain weighing two and a half million tons. The Aztecs worshipped the sun as the source of all life. They offered human sacrifices to the sun god atop stone pyramids marked with hieroglyphics. Vague symbols relating the history of an ancient people. Archaeology seeks answers to questions about man's past by digging through what he has left behind.
Later, they uncovered a chain of riddles which stretches across the expanse of modern Mexico. A mile to the south is the temple of Quetzalcoatl. Legend tells us that he was a light-skinned, bearded man who came from the stars. Supposedly, he taught men law, the arts, and the cultivation of corn. The head of a great feathered serpent represents the god Quetzalcoatl. When Quetzalcoatl finished his mission on Earth, he departed to his native star, promising to come back someday. It is a pervasive part of mythology that gods fly to the stars with a pledge to return. The strain runs through all folklore. The ruins of the deserted city of Tula rest about 20 miles from Teotihuacan. It was one of the cities supposedly linked in legend to a ladder hung in the sky. Monumental sculptures stand a silent watch over the remains, guardians of an eternal mystery. They appear to be warriors, dressed alike, wearing unusual helmets. They carry some sort of box-like unit on their chests. Perhaps they are weapons or communications equipment. Unrecognizable tools or controls are clasped in their hands. The nearby sacred well of Cenote forms a perfectly round crater in the rock. It is unlikely that it could have been formed naturally or by human excavation. It does, however, resemble a crater made by the exhaust gases of a very powerful rocket engine. To the east of Cenote is the ancient Mayan city of Chichen Itza. About 600 AD, the entire Mayan population fled northward. There is no trace of war, plague, or famine to account for the move. Outstanding astronomers, Mayans calendared the year by constructing a central pyramid with 365 steps. They also developed a formula to predict eclipses without ever knowing about the revolution of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. There is no way of telling how they discovered these secrets. But von Daniken believes that some ancient astronaut may have told them of the solar system in which they lived. A stone relief portrays a god in a helmet with projections resembling antennae. The Mayans name their patron Kuku Khan. In every 6,000 years, the Mayan calendar is off by only one day. Such was the gift of Kuku Khan. Kuku Khan supposedly came from the stars and returned to them, leaving the Mayans to build observatories to search the heavens for him. Perhaps with our modern observatories and telescopes, we are still searching for Kuku Khan and Quetzalcoatl, who deserted to ancient skies. Modern science examines the heavens in search of information. Data, according to Dr. Werner von Braun, that gives us perspective on our own brief existence in the firmament. I think it is important to remember that uh, distant stars are not only far away from us in terms of miles, but uh, life on other planets can also be very far away from us in terms of time. Uh, the Earth is believed to be approximately five billion years old, and if you condense mentally these five billion years uh, into one year, then the presence of men on this Earth would be about one minute out of that one year, and the period since men uh, understood radio and was capable of effectively communicating with heavenly bodies outside of the earth uh, would only be approximately one second out of that year. So if you want to communicate with another heavenly body and intelligent life they are on, you have to reach 
that other heavenly body also at a time when these people have invented the radio and know how to operate it and to have their receivers going, so to speak. But we had no receivers going. Even a mere 50 years ago, we were too busy with the steam engine and the biplane. Dr. Harold Klein. It is highly possible that advanced civilizations have in the past or may in the present try or have tried to uh, contact us, to survey us, to uh, watch us. We cannot rule that out. We have no indications of that. It may be equally possible that a really intelligent society has watched us for some time, has looked us over and decided based on our activities that uh, this planet is beneath their dignity, so to speak, and is simply not worth bothering with. Quite possibly, we were too backward to bother with, but we have come a long way in a short time, and we are prepared to reach out into the universe. Writer and sociologist Eric Hoffer suggests a reason for our return to space. He wrote, I always felt that man is a stranger on this planet, a total stranger. I always played with the fancy, maybe a contagion from outer space is the seed of man. Hence our prior occupation with heaven, with the sky, with the stars, the gods, somewhere out there in outer space. It is a kind of homing impulse. We are drawn to where we came from. In the seventh decade of the 20th century, the landscape of the moon became familiar. Man went to the moon on his first mission in search of life. With him, he had to take his own life support system. He was encased in a portable environment, susceptible to deadly radiation. If space travelers from another planet were to visit Earth, they too might find the environment hostile, if not deadly. They too would have to travel as self-contained units. But whatever their basic forms, in appearance they may have resembled modern astronauts. On a rocky ledge in the Sahara Desert is a drawing estimated to have been painted there over 15,000 years ago. If not an astronaut, then what is this floating apparition? Henri Loti, the early French archaeologist, discovered the image of a 19-foot giant and called him the great god Mars.
Across the Mediterranean, at Valcominica, near Brescia, Italy, rock paintings have tried to tell their story since before recorded time. They are portrayals of strange beings in bulky overalls. Their helmets seem to carry antennae. In their hands are clasped some matter of tool or weapon. Still more evidence can be found in a 2,000-year-old rock painting found in Japan. In the rough, rocky countryside of Northwest Australia, there are scores of rock paintings which date back far in time. Drawings which are probably some of the earliest messages from prehistoric man. Sketches represent the activities of one Gina, a legendary goddess of the Milky Way. She too came from heaven to instruct the children of Earth. Von Daniken believes there were models, possibly even one model for all the deities found recorded in rock. The mysteries of the past manifest themselves on all continents. Depths of a temple in the ancient Mayan city of Palanque in Central America. Von Daniken came upon a stone relief of what is apparently a man seated in a capsule watching something intently. His hand seemed to be operating some undefinable controls. His foot pressing a lever. And at the rear of the capsule are jets trailing flames behind them. He seems to be dressed for the job in trousers with a broad belt, a sort of jacket, tight-fitting at the wrists. The chair is well upholstered to absorb the shock of acceleration. Legend says that he represents their space traveling god, Kuku Klan, the winged god of Palanque. He was carved sometime in the 7th century. The possibility haunts us that this figure was the artist's rendering of the ancient astronauts who inspired the Mayan culture. The church of the monastery of Desane was decorated with mysterious frescoes some 500 years ago. The monastery is hidden away in the peaceful countryside of southern Yugoslavia. High above the chapel, almost out of sight, the fresco silently challenges our minds with its startling story. It depicts what may have been the first air battle to be witnessed by man almost 500 years before the known discovery of flight. In the first capsule, a man is seated with his hand on some form of guidance mechanism. He appears to be racing across the sky in an attempt to escape from a pursuing ship. We can easily imagine jets at the rear of these aerodynamic forms. On the earth below them, people cower in fear as this air battle wages in the skies.
If not an astronaut, then what reality might have inspired the frescoes of Dessanay? Myths, legends, legacies of ancient men have not all been lost in ambiguous reference. History is the scribe of man. There are records in cuneiform, Sanskrit, Amharic, Tibetan, and languages which have not yet even been deciphered. New texts are constantly being discovered. Some, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, are readily understandable to scholars. Translating other fragments of written history is laborious and time-consuming. Only a minute fraction of surviving texts have actually been transcribed. Accounts of godlike visitors abound. For example, in the books of the Tibetan Kanchur. The Kanchur consists of over a thousand volumes containing the holy texts of Lamaism. Their secret code is the most complex ever devised. To date, only one one hundredth of the Kanchur has been deciphered. The resulting translations are full of references to gods appearing in the sky of the luminous pearls and transparent spheres in which they lived. Once the books have been further deciphered, they may well yield much more information about mysterious space visitors. Closer to Western civilization, we have one of the world's most detailed records, the Bible. The Bible says that the Lord caused to rain upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire. God sent his messengers to warn Lot's family of impending disaster. The angels told Lot, flee for your life. Do not look back. Flee to the hills lest you be consumed. The messengers were insistent that he leave the city immediately. Von Donneken wondered if they had foreknowledge of an impending cataclysmic explosion. It appears certain that Sodom and Gomorrah were leveled, laid waste at a single stroke. All traces of the communities have disappeared. So complete was the destruction. The report of the catastrophe ends. Then he looked down and beheld and lo, the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Mount Horeb in the Sinai Range rises more than 6,500 feet above sea level. Here Moses received the Ten Commandments. Here too he was given the blueprints for the Ark of the Covenant. In chapter 25 of the second book of Moses, directions are given for the construction of the holy tabernacle. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, and you shall overlay it with pure gold within and without shall you overlay it. And you shall make upon it a molding of gold round about. Moses was to provide special shoes and clothing which would properly insulate his workmen. Moses was warned that no one should come near the structure. It represented a mortal danger. And though Moses would hear a voice from the covering plate, no figure could be seen. If we were to build a replica of the Ark today, according to Moses' instructions, we would have a condenser charged with several hundred volts. Could the gold sheet have been a form of loudspeaker, a two-way radio, reproducing a voice from afar, it is part of the Von Donneken theory, a romantic's explanation of biblical text based on imagination and wonder. In the fragmentary histories from the Bible to the scripts of Babylon, there are tantalizing views of Earth seen from a distance, seen from space, seen by whom? Was it the vision of ancient astronauts communicated to the primitive population of a still young, 
planet Earth. If we were to land on a strange planet, we would probably avoid its magnetically disruptive poles. If travelers from outer space were to land here, a likely location almost on the equator would be Egypt. The pyramids, eternal mysteries in themselves, provide additional evidence to support the premise that Earth was visited by ancient astronauts. The Great Pyramid rises to a height of 477 feet, 2,300,000 stone blocks, each a crushing two and a half tons, each perfectly fitting, climb toward the sky. The stones were transported from the Makadam Mountains on the far side of the Nile. 20,000 workmen hauling 10 blocks a day would need 640 years, more than 30 generations, to build one pyramid. To some, the massive structures were not designed as tombs for the pharaohs, but are in reality vast astronomical calculators. Passageways, for example, from the interior, point directly at the North Star, the way back to the heavens. If we multiply the height of the pyramid by one billion, it equals almost exactly the distance from the Earth to the Sun.
Ed seemed to know something that all of us do not know, or he had somehow recovered a knowledge that the ancient Egyptians had, and this is the only rational explanation for the 1100 tons of coral that now resides in Homestead, Florida. He always said that he had the secrets of anti-gravity and magnetic fields, and he also said that he knew how they built the pyramids. So it appears if he was telling the truth, that uh, it looks like he did have these secrets.
At the end of the 16th century, the Dutch mathematician Ludolf arrived at the figure pi, by which one can determine the circumference of a circle. If we divide the perimeter of the base of the pyramid by twice the height, we get exactly the figure pi, which Ludolf only found 4,000 years later. All the evidence leads von Daniken to conclude that the pyramid is linked to the arrival of visitors from outer space, and that they may have used it as a marking place, a map reference for navigation. When modern Egypt chose to construct the Aswan Dam, there stood one obstacle. The flooding would submerge the 3,000-year-old temple of Abu Simbel. Over a hundred nations answered UNESCO's plea to save the monument. Latest equipment and engineering techniques were used. Still, it took three years to accomplish, because centuries were needed for the original builders to create the temples. It is probable they honor no single pharaoh. They stand, however, in tribute to the gods of the sun, the center of Egyptian religions, and to those who return from Earth to the skies. The Salisbury Plain lies along the Wales border. A large mound rises ominously from the level expanse. The legends surrounding it suggest that it was a place of burial, not unlike the pyramids of Egypt. Close by stands Stonehenge, rock formations strewn about like so many toy blocks. It is believed to have been built 2,000 years ago. According to legend, Merlin, the magician of King Arthur's court, transported the huge slabs by magical incantations from what is now Scotland. Recent studies have employed computers to measure the distances and placements of the stones. These findings prove to some extent that Stonehenge served as a giant calendar and observatory. By visually lining up specific points, an almost exact calculation can be made as to the movement of the stars and planets. Even with computers, it has taken us years to arrive at these figures. 2,000 years ago, this area of England was inhabited only by primitive tribal people. Some still believe that Stonehenge is a temple built by the ancient Druids, the priests of the pagan Celts, and was the site of witches' conclaves and human sacrifice. The Druids still exist and continue to conduct their religious services on this site. It has been suggested that the Druids may not have built this place, but simply taken it over as their shrine. If so, then there is no trace of who might have built and left it behind. Tribes that vanished, whole civilizations that disappeared. It has happened too many times to be coincidence. Guarding the headwaters of the Amazon River are the ruins of Machu Picchu, an outpost of Peruvian Inca society. Some archaeologists suggest that the Incas found they could not extend their empire into the treacherous Amazon jungle. And so, here they stopped, and here they died. There is a curious folk legend surrounding the origin of this fortress. It is said to have been built by a divine race of light-skinned, auburn-haired descendants of the god Virachochus, who arrived in a flaming chariot. Nothing remains of these supposed people, but the legend goes on to say that they abandoned their citadel and returned to the skies. They left only the ruins of their mountaintop city for us to wonder at. The construction of defensive citadels was common to many tribal communities. On the African continent and the bushlands of southern Rhodesia are the ruins of Simbabui, meaning the heart of the lion. It is constructed of brick-shaped granite rocks, all exactly alike as if produced in a factory. 
20,000 tons of identical building stones. They were laid to a height of over 30 feet to form walls which have stood for thousands of years. What masons trimmed and piled these stones with such astonishing perfection? Were they the ancestors of Bushmen whose straw huts surround the ruins? Or members of a visiting group of master builders? The mystery carried von Donneken back to the Valley of the Kings in Egypt near Luxor. The valley was another royal burial ground of the pharaohs, the god kings. Not pyramids of stone, but a small mountain range converted to the use of the dead. The entrances were hidden, little more than windows into the rock, with steep stairs and winding passageways leading to the tomb of the nine-year-old pharaoh god Tutankhamun. The crypt is hollowed directly out of stone, and incredibly intricate murals decorate the walls and ceilings. Archaeologists have carefully studied the markings and meanings, but von Donneken points out one interesting fact. They could not have been painted by firelight. The ceilings show no trace of soot, and so no torches or oil lamps were used. What then was the light source? Markings found in this and other tombs are portraits of the god Osiris, Osiris played an important role in Egyptian religious belief. After giving knowledge to the world, he left the earth and exists in the heavens. Each dead pharaoh, the kings of earth, joined the spirit of Osiris in the heavens. Their mummified remains were prepared for the journey. In the golden armor casing, whom were they imitating? Outside the cave crypt stand the remains of the ancient mortuary, the temple of Amenhotep III. Here the Egyptian priests preserve the remains of their rulers. We will never know the origins of the science of mummification. Perhaps it was an imitation of a physical conservation method used by extraterrestrial visitors. The secrets died along with the mortuary during the great earthquake in the year 27 BC. Some distance away, guarding the entrance to this temple of the dead, rests the Memnon Colossi, 2,000 years old, 52 feet high, each weighing over a thousand tons. It is difficult for us to imagine them being moved from the distant quarries by manpower alone. And so the sentinels of the temple evoke images of a time when the activity inside was directed by godlike visitors who came as masters to earth. The Sphinx, symbol of the riddle, the eternal enigma, the head of a man, the body of a lion. This fierce stone creature faces the rising sun the flaming chariot of the Egyptian gods. It is meant to protect the sonship when it lands to carry the pharaohs back to the heavens. Secrets in stone abound throughout the world. Easter Island, Isle of a Thousand Mysteries, minute, lost in the watery expanse of the South Pacific, 3,000 miles off the coast of Chile. The inhabitants call their island Matakitarani, which means eyes looking up to heaven. The neighboring atoll is called the island of the bird people, creatures with human bodies in the heads of birds. Von Donneken suggests that these bird heads could also be helmets equipped with a type of mask. The island's ancient legends tell of flying people who arrived amidst fire and thundering noise. The landscape is dominated by volcanic cratered lakes. Today about 2,000 people live here. 
There were never more than 4,000 natives at any time. Of the total population, 70% were women, children, or the elderly. The majority of able-bodied men was needed for the production of food. Thus, the number of workmen was so small that it would have been impossible for them to create the more than 600 gigantic stone figures found everywhere on the island. stone gods stand 65 feet high and weigh nearly 400 tons. Most of the sculptures are but partly exposed. Only excavation reveals their true size. The figures are all the same. An unusual type of human wearing the same haughty, taciturn expression. statue unearthed by explorer Thor Heyerdahl suggests man's role. Unlike the others, it has a rounded head and is kneeling. The workshop at the volcanic crater, Ranoraraku, has stone so hard that repeated hammering with a stone chisel hardly scratches it. The colossi carved here were removed to distances as much as 12 miles from this location. There was no army of slaves for labor, no wood for rollers, nor the slightest traces to suggest that the sculptures were dragged across the island. And so they lie here, mute, eyes looking up to heaven. Easter Island might have been the key to many mysteries. When it was first discovered, a group of wooden tablets covered with hieroglyphics were found. But zealous missionaries burned them, sealing the secrets of the monoliths. So we must look elsewhere for explanations. The legends of Easter Island claim that the stone giants moved themselves with the help of mana, a mysterious force which only two priests could invoke. And that one day the priest disappeared, and so did the mana. What was mana? Von Daniken wondered if there were strangers from other planets possessed of extraordinary powers. Did they have the ability to defy the laws of gravity? To this day, Easter Island exerts an unusually strong magnetism. The report of a French expedition in 1964 ends as follows. Since there are inexplicable magnetic forces, and unusual geological phenomena on Easter Island. One cannot exclude the possibility of extraterrestrial contacts. from Easter Island is the Bay of Pisco along the coast of southern Peru. From the ground there is what appear to be a meaningless set of lines, but from a high altitude they form a trident 300 feet long pointing the way inland. Pointing the way to what? Across the scorched and rocky terrain are spread the remains of deserted ancient cities. An entire civilization, now vanished, once flourished around the mysterious plain of Nazca. Lines running toward us, away. Lines which mean nothing from the ground. Long furrows cut into the iron-rich parched soil, cut there at least 2,000 years ago.
From a great height, from an aircraft, for instance, the lines fall into focus. We see a spider, an eagle, a peacock, and a hummingbird, none of which can be recognized from the ground. And there is no observation point, no mountain nearby overlooking the plane. The giant drawings must have been directed by someone hovering high above. Straight as arrows, one huge geometric puzzle. Some lines parallel, some intersecting. Starting nowhere and ending nowhere. The conclusion reached by von Däniken is that the lines represent a landing field. The plane of Nazca is a gigantic abandoned airport. Landing strips, roads and flattened beds that resemble rocket launch ramps were cut into the plateau. In a radius of 1,000 miles, enduring archaeological mysteries abound. And the question arises, was this the center, the base camp of an ancient astronaut colony? Around the world we have seen carvings in Japan, Egypt, Australia, Yugoslavia. And all bear a striking resemblance to the carvings at Nazca. Earth visited by creatures, astronauts from another planet. We have only fragments, but look up into the sky some clear starlit night and allow yourself the freedom to wonder. Giant radio telescopes are scanning the stars for signals. Some are even sending signals, not to anyone in particular, but to anyone who may be able to hear them. By some incredible coincidence, perhaps we will establish a dialogue with an extraterrestrial community, even if that conversation is only a matter of meaningless blips and dots. NASA recently launched an aluminum greeting card into space, addressed in effect to whom it may concern. Etched on the plaque are the nude figures of a man and a woman, two-digit computer code numbers, and a diagram showing Earth's location within the nine planets of our solar system. A message to whatever intelligent life there may be in the universe. Hello from Earth to some wandering ancient astronaut. NASA is especially interested in the possibility of life on the planet Mars. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California has had a direct line to Mars via the Mariner 9 spacecraft, which has been taking extensive photographs as it orbits the red planet. Mars is a world significantly like the Earth in terms of atmosphere, temperature, and gravity. It is also the closest and easiest to explore in depth. To date, no recognizable life has been detected. But the same was true of previous Mars missions. The last time photographs were taken, scientists agreed that there was definitely no life on Mars. However, the smallest area the spacecraft's camera could focus on was three miles wide. Therefore, the only things we might have missed are a couple of mile-long elephants. 
Dr. Carl Sagan is one of the directors of the Mariner mission exploring Mars. And he has a special interest in the possibilities of intelligent life in the universe. The question arises, might there have been a visit to the Earth in historical times? There are popular books on this subject. Um, it's an idea which people find exciting. It's a kind of mm, scientific justification of theological belief which people would rather believe uh, uh, in any case. Uh, it's kind of modern dress for old-time religion. Well, what about that? Is, it, is that possible or not? I can only say that you can't exclude the possibility, but there's not a smidgen of evidence that is compelling. 